We'll call the Public Safety and Security Policy and Finance meeting to order. We'll start with the roll call. Johnson. Here. Lomer. Here. Hillstrom. Here. Beckerfin. Here. Considine. Dean. Here. Frankie. Here. Grossel. Here. Howe. Lucero. Newberger. O'Neill. Here. Pinto. Here. Booglum. Ward. Here. Zerwas. Here. Representative Newberger, have you had a chance to review the minutes? Uh, yes, Mr. <laughs> Chair, after careful scrutiny and study, I found that they are in order and I would like to move them. All those in favor say aye. 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 So moved. This morning we're going to start with uh, Representative Frankie. Representative Frank, do you wish to uh, <clears throat> move your bill to be laid over for possible inclusion? Yes, Mr. Chair, I'd like to move my bill, bill number 2932, and have it laid over for possible inclusion. Please go ahead. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, um, House File 2932 is a bill which would expand the crimes of criminal vehicular homicide and criminal vehicular operation that applies to cases where drivers operate a motor vehicle in a negligent manner while operating a cell phone or other electronic device in a manner without the use of a hands-free setting and causes death or bodily harm to another. Um, I would like to start off by saying I appreciate, Chair, you allowing this bill to move forward um, and everybody for listening. We went through and heard on Tuesday a lot of the where's, why's, and how's, so I did not want to rehash a lot of that. We all know a lot of the information that's out there and about the, I would say, epidemic we're having with distracted driving. Um, I will just move forward with testimony and my testifiers. Um, I have with me today Ryan Verdick, whose wife was tragically killed in a distracted driving accident, and Kathy Kena, a Dakota County Prosecutor's Office. So with that, I would like to ask Ryan to come up and present his story to let you know how this bill would help and how um, distracted driving impacted his life. <clears throat> Mr. Burdick, welcome to the committee. If you could introduce yourself and then proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Ryan Verdeck. <clears throat> and I'm here today, Mr. Chairman and fellow members, because on April 26, 2015, I was forced into life as a single dad with two young daughters. My wife, Penny, was riding her bike, doing what she loved to do. She was getting herself ready for triathlon season. She loved to race. She was riding on a county road when she was struck and killed by a person driving a motor vehicle. The defendant was eventually charged with cr criminal vehicular homicide, careless driving, and unlawful use of a motor vi mo mobile device while driving. After a three-day court trial, she was found not guilty on criminal vehicular homicide, not guilty on texting and driving, and guilty of only careless driving. And here are some of the court's um, facts from the case. A lot of this is coming right from the court's findings of fact in his, in his memorandum. Penny was riding her bicycle and the defendant were both eastbound in the eastbound lane of McLeod County Road 3. That's a paved county road with all the center lines, fog lines, and rumble strips. Penny was riding her bicycle where she was legally required to ride a bicycle with the flow of traffic on the right side of the road. Even after me telling her for years, ride against traffic. There's a lot of drivers out there that don't see you. They're distracted. You can see them. You can avoid them. But it's the law. And Penny followed the law, so she was eastbound in the eastbound lane. <clears throat> At 3.57.13 in the afternoon, both Penny and the defendant were eastbound. The defendant's phone registered previously received text messages as being read. That means they popped up on the screen. This is based on a forensic analysis by the Minnesota Bureau of Criminal Apprehension. These messages don't just pop up on the screen by magic. The phone has to be manipulated to show as read. They had showed as received earlier. They showed as read at that time. 
the defendant's phone was locked and could only be unlocked by either a passcode on the phone or her thumbprint. Penny had a GPS device on her bike. She tracked her rides, how fast she went, her average pace. Apparently it's a thing with racers. Seven seconds after the text messages in the defendant's phone were marked as red, Penny was driving 13 miles an hour. That's about her average speed for an, for an afternoon cruise. Two seconds later, her speed was 30 miles per hour. That's because she was on the hood and the windshield of the defendant's vehicle. The defendant did not apply her brakes until after impact with Penny. That was from the State Patrol reconstruction. Penny's bicycle tire, her rear tire, left a skid mark at the point of impact. The skid mark was approximately two feet from the rumble strip of the road and indicated she was going perfectly straight. The front license plate of the defendant's vehicle was broken off the car and in the shape of a U or a V. There was also a crease in her front bumper immediately behind where the license plate would be, both matching Penny's rear tire. The impact of Penny's bike was dead center of that vehicle. That vehicle was over the fog line, over the rumble strips and had no idea where she was. Again, I remind you, there were no brakes applied until after the point of impact with Penny. 46 seconds after the text messages were marked as being read or popped up on the screen of the phone is when the defendant called 911. From the scene of the crash until the very end of the trial and even in her court ordered letter of apology to me, the defendant maintained what I call the immaculate conception defense. Penny appeared out of nowhere. Couldn't have seen her. There's nothing I could do. This was a clear day at the end of April, nearly four o'clock in the afternoon. The sun was high in the sky and slightly behind the defendant and Penny. According to the state patrol reconstruction, the, the defendant's speed was estimated to be approximately 49 to 52 miles an hour. Not a factor. It's a county road out in the country. It's a 55 mile an hour speed limit. From the top of a very small incline on that road to the point of impact, the defendant had a quarter of a mile, approximately 1,320 feet, and a minimum of 17 seconds of clear, unobstructed visibility before striking and killing Penny. Again, no brakes were applied until after the point of impact. There were no obstructions. This is late April. There were no crops in the field. There were no grass, no weeds, or no other vegetation growing along the road. Penny just magically appeared out of nowhere. During trial, the defendant was able to convince the court that she didn't actually read the text messages. She said she unlocked her phone to change a Pandora station, which is a web-based internet radio station she was listening to by a Bluetooth speaker on the passenger seat of her vehicle. So she said, nope, I, the last thing I did before I left my home was send a text message. So when I unlocked my phone to change my Pandora station, the text messages showed up on my screen and that's why they were shown red. Okay, but still by her own admittance, she accessed her phone. Um, but because it was, wasn't proven beyond a reasonable doubt that she sent, received, or composed a text message, she was found not guilty of both the vehicular homicide and the texting and driving, found guilty only of careless driving. She got 30 days in jail, minimal restitution, no fine, and a misdemeanor conviction. Our family's goal through this whole process has been to try and make sure that we don't add to these people sitting behind me holding these pictures. We don't want somebody else to go through this. Nobody decided to put their phone down because of this conviction, because of 30 days in jail and a misdemeanor conviction. Every behavior stays the same. I still see it on the news quite often. We were insulted and me and Penny's family were disappointed in the system. Had the defendant been intoxicated by alcohol or, or a controlled substance, statute would apply. But the way the statute was written, the judge felt that she was not guilty of, of it, again, as written. There's no accountability when it comes to distracted driving, when you hurt or kill an innocent person, the way things are currently set up. This needs to change. Behavior needs to change, and part of this is punishment. In today's society, we can't change behavior without at least a threat of punishment. I'm hoping that today's distracted driving was my seatbelt. When I grew up, when I first got my license, nobody could wear seatbelts. Nobody wore seatbelts. Through increased enforcement, increased education, more penalties, you know, that's when seatbelt law became a primary offense. Who gets in a car without putting a seatbelt on now? Not many people. 
I want distracted driving to get that way too. I want people to put their seatbelt on and put their phone away. <clears throat> I, nor anybody else, ever claimed that the defendant woke up that morning and said, I'm gonna kill somebody on a bicycle today. There's never any intent. No one ever said there was intent. But on the other side of that coin, Penny didn't wake up and say, today's the day I'm gonna die. And Penny should not have died that day. Many decisions were made by the driver of that car, and those decisions had serious consequences for myself, my children, and our family, but not the driver. Killing somebody in this manner with the facts that I, I had given you is unfathomable that it wasn't a felony offense. Would prison time have been appropriate in this case? No, <laughs> I don't believe it would have been. Would more than a misdemeanor conviction and 30 days in jail have been appropriate? Our family very thoroughly believes so. I don't believe it's appropriate for any, every case of death or great bodily harm, but we need to change the laws. We need to hold the people accountable. People are losing their lives. Prosecutors don't have the tools they need to bring these charges for proper resolution. We lost our mom, our wife, our daughter, our sister, our aunt, and our friend. The list is endless. <clears throat> a misdemeanor conviction and 30 days in jail is not a punishment that fits the crime. It's time today's laws and punishments try to catch up with today's technology. It's a race we'll probably never win. Technology advances far too fast, but we have to make an attempt. I see distracted driving nearly every day on the road. I drive about 3,000 miles a month from my job at work. I see it every day. I see it almost every day on the news. And sadly, punishment is always similar, very neg negligible. It's time that being under the influence of a mobile device has consequences similar to being under the influence of alcohol or a controlled substance. The consequences for the victims are the same. The consequences for the defendant should also be the same. Priorities need to change and people need to be accountable. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and fellow members. <coughs> Representative Becker Finn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, uh, Representative Frankie, for bringing this bill forward, and thank you for, for your testimony. Um, and I, I'm sorry that this has happened so many times that I honestly can't remember. Is Was yours the case where she was pulling your children in the bike trailer? No, okay. that was about a year, less than a year prior to ours. And and I, I, I bring that up because it's clearly not uh, a single incident. This is Correct. a trend that's happening because of behaviors people are, are choosing to take. Correct. And um, I, I commend you for sharing your story because I'm sure um, it was difficult uh, to do that and, and to talk about it because it really, is a terrible thing and I'm I'm also a mom who pulls a bike trailer and I, I think about your wife and the other people who have been killed in the similar way every time I go somewhere with my kids. I have a, a seven year old who recently learned to ride his bike and I have to teach him to walk his bike so we're against traffic until we get to a place where we don't have to worry about people looking, looking at their phones. And, and I had to convince a nine year old to ride her bike again. She would not ride her bike even in town. We live in the country and, and they home based at grandma's house in town so they could go swimming and go to their friends and she walked everywhere for the longest time. She, would, she didn't want to get on her bike again because she was scared to death. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your story thank you. and, and thank you everyone for being here. It's, it's definitely an important issue, so. Thank you. Kathy Kina. Mr. Chair, other members, my name is Kathy Kina. I'm the criminal division head in the Dakota County Attorney's Office. And I'm here today on behalf of County Attorney Jim Backstrom and Washington County Attorney Pete Orpit who are very, uh, really leading the charge on this legislation. Un unfortunately, they both had to attend an NDAA meeting today out of state. Uh, I don't know that I can say anything more eloquently than what you've just heard from Mr. Burdick on the frustrations that prosecutors face in these cases. This bill will fill a gap. 
it will allow prosecutors to treat this type of negligent driving the same as someone driving under the influence of controlled substances or alcohol. And I really appreciated Mr. Burdick's comparison of driving under the use of a cell phone. And it's not just cell phones, it's, it's other electronic devices as well, uh, in such things as laptops, iPads, things of that nature. And I do want to note that this legislation is supported by the Minnesota County Attorneys Association. And, and I know you've heard a lot with the hands-free um, legislation and, and the numbers and whatnot, but I think it bears worth repeating. Because this type of behavior, distracted driving, poses a significant threat to public safety. During daylight hours, approximately 660,000 drivers use their cell phones while driving. This creates a significant potential for death and injuries on our roads, and research bears this out. Studies have shown the overall crash risk increased 3.6 times over model driving when a driver uses a handheld device. According to the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, in 2015 alone, 3,477 people were killed and 391,000 were injured in motor vehicle crashes involving distracted drivers. In Minnesota, in that same year, 2015, there were 411 traffic deaths on our roadways. 74 were caused by distracted driving compared to 95 caused by alcohol impairment. Under current Minnesota law, a person who drives a motor vehicle in a negligent manner while using a cell phone or other electronic device and who kills or seriously injures another person may only be charged with a misdemeanor careless driving or potentially a gross misdemeanor reckless driving. Utilizing the gross negligence provision in the current criminal vehicular homicide and operation statutes is not an option in cases where the only activity that we have is somebody utilizing a cell phone or an electronic device. And the reason being is because gross negligence is defined to mean with very great negligence or without even scant care. And current case law provides that simply a person driving with using a cell phone does not constitute gross negligence. So our hands are tied. And I'll be frank with you, I am, I am so tired of having to sit down and tell people, like Mr. Burdick, and I'm sorry, but I'm sorry, all I can charge is a careless driving. It's a misdemeanor. It's not fair. And this legislation will not only serve as punishment for people who choose to break the law, but will also serve as a deterrent for those. And, and I, I agree, I, I was thinking about this last night. You know, everybody's up in arms, everybody's so accustomed to being able to use their cell phones while they're driving. And this law doesn't prohibit that. It just states you have to do it in hands-free mode. But I had the same thought, you know, oh, this is going to cause such an uproar because people are so accustomed to that. But it was the same thing with the seatbelts. Never thought that people would really follow that law that, and, and realize for public safety purposes, how important that law was. And this law, and the one that you consider with the hands-free use, are just as important. So I strongly encourage you to fill that gap and make this crime a felony. Thank you. Rep Representative Ward. Thank you, Mr. Chair, <coughs> and thanks to the testifiers and the guests here today. Um, this late in the session, in a very short session, I doubt if there's anything that we can do, especially because of what I'm going to suggest involves funding. But next year, um, I think we should put together a bill that also includes some education funding 
Remember the um, Friends Don't Let Friends Drive campaign? Uh, commercials, te you know, television messages, all sorts of messages about taking someone's keys or letting there be a designated driver and things like that. <coughs> I'm hoping that we could do an education campaign that would also reinforce this, uh, this message and, and change the culture, um, change the customs, change our mores and, and practices so that we can actually uh, do more than punish people and send a message that you're going to get punished, but also do some education up front. And perhaps we can do that next year. Representative Uglum. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and thank you, Representative Frankie, for bringing this bill to us. I guess you all know what I'm going to say. Um, and, and um, you know, the, the passage last uh, Tuesday of the hands-free bill out of this uh, committee is a gigantic step forward. <clears throat> My bill did not increase the penalties. Uh, many, many, many people have said that we have to do this. You've just seen a perfect example of why we must. And I think that, uh, I think that Representative Frankie uh, has said this before, the laws have to catch up with the crime. And, and this is a perfect example, and it's only one. It's only one example of all the people that have been injured by distracted driving. Uh, and the system is broken. The system is broken right now in terms of, of the penalties involved. And, and it's going to be a long haul. It's going to be a long haul for people to understand that using a cell phone in a negligent manner is just like DUI. It's going to be a long haul for us to, to, to change people's perceptions about this because we're married to these things. Um, and this is a very, very good step also in this direction. So obviously I support uh, Representative Frankie and the, uh, and the community and I hope that this committee will see, see their way fit to pass this bill on and, and let's get it to the floor and, and get things done and save lives. Thank you. Representative Frankie, did you have? <clears throat> Representative Constantine. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Frankie, for bringing it forward. Anytime somebody's breaking the law and they kill somebody, there should be consequences. Um, I'm really sorry for your loss. I wish I would have gotten 30 days jail for my brother. The guy that killed him got 30 days home arrest. Um, thank you for bringing this forward. Representative Pinto. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, Mr. Verdict, for sharing your experience and, and the folks who are here, and um, and uh, for Assistant County Attorney Keene, it, it takes a lot to. Um, uh, I'm sure, as a seasoned prosecutor, you've handled a lot of cases, and uh, and and to have the emotion come through is really powerful. Um, it's important to me as we as we adjust penalties and are creating crimes as to how they fit into the broader statutory scheme. And I guess I just want to point out to folks, um, and Representative Frankie, thank you so much for bringing this forward, just to point out that this really um, has been a, a gap. Because um, as our state, we say if you cause a death when you're grossly negligent, which is a pretty high standard, there's a pretty good penalty. Same penalty if you're negligent while you're drinking, uh, you know, you have alcohol involved. Um, and this is simply a statement that this kind of behavior is equivalent to those other kinds of behavior, um, which of course it is. Um, so thank you so much to um, Representative Frankie and to the testifiers for helping us to close that gap to say if you have that kind of behavior, it's the same kind of thing. And I think that as we have that statement, that goes a long way towards the education representative Ward was referring to um, and, uh, and says as a state that similar behavior is gonna have similar consequences um, and certainly it should in this case. So thank you very much. Representative Hillstrom. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And actually this question is for you, uh, Mr. Chair. So the motion is to lay it over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill. I see that it has a fiscal note. So uh, Mr. Chair, do you anticipate that we are going to see an omnibus bill that has a um, budget target? Uh, Representative Hillstrom, I'm hoping so. Okay. Right. Representative Lucero. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and maybe a question for the, the bill author. I was just conferring with uh, colleague Mark Uglum here. In the bill we heard earlier this week, uh, there was a, a, a specific exclusion for the definition of hands-free for integrated systems. I looked at the bill here and I don't see a definition in the language. Uh, hands-free is not defined here. So is it your understanding that the language per your bill does not provide an exclusion for integrated systems? Representative Frankie. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Lucero, I do have an amendment here that I did not get in on time that does lay out definitions. So we will address that going forward should we include it in the omnibus bill. Representative Lucero. Uh, Mr. Chair, I just came from civil law and in other committees. If there's uh, an opportunity, if there's no objection from members of the committee, amendments are offered or, uh, you know, Consider that have not made it on deadline. Is this one of those amendments you, the committee might be willing to consider? We, we Representative Lucero, we can certainly look at that. Uh, maybe the page could hand out the amendment so we could take a look at it. Representative Lucero. Uh, thank you. I was not aware that the motion was to lay over. Yep. Uh, I thought we were moving it on somewhere. So since we're laying it over, I think that there's an opportunity to consider this okay, later. Anyone else? <clears throat> Any testimony from the public? Okay, okay Representative Pranky, I want to thank you. Myself, thank you for bringing this forward and for the testifiers, thank you for your testimony. It is, is an issue that I've been, been looking at and I want to really thank Representative Frankie for bringing this forward. And with that, do you have any final comments? Um, I did, Mr. Chair, but Representative Ooglin stole them. <laughs> <laughs> so I, we all know this is an issue. Um, we definitely, as everybody said, need to close the gap. And as I've said, and Representative Uglum reiterated, we need the laws to catch up with the technology. And we need to be able to give our judges and our hardworking prosecutors the tools they need to be successful. Um, and I just wanted to respond quickly also to Representative Ward. I did drop a bill today that requires 30 minutes of distracted driving training in um, uh, the classroom for uh, when kids are going for driver's training or driver's ed. Um, so that should hit the books and then we'll start working on that and then I look forward to working on more of a broader initiative, so thank you. So with that, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, members, for hearing this. Okay. <clears throat> Representative Frankie, just so you're aware, my son just finished driver's ed and they do, a one, they do about a one hour block on that already. That's good. So with that, we will lay the bill over. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, members. Thank you. Representative Johnson, Chair Johnson, would you like to introduce your bill or move your bill? I will move uh, House File 2855 for possible inclusion and uh, lay it over. 
you may proceed. Members, House File 2855 deals with a situation that occurred after the previous biennium. How many of you know the former chair, Representative Cornish, worked very hard uh, working on the drug sentencing issue. Uh, work, yet was able to work with all the stakeholders on that, put it all together, and came to an agreement that not everybody alike, but they all agreed that, <clears throat> of how to proceed from there. One of the agreements was that uh, in the sentencing there would be no look back, which, which uh, some people liked, some people didn't, but they all agreed to do that in order to get the, get the bill passed. Unfortunately, uh, a, the Supreme Court decided to do that differently. Uh, dealing with the case involving <clears throat> the case involving uh, applied the state versus Kirby or the humiliation doctrine, um, which instead of looking at the intent of what the legislator, legislation that was passed, and it was talked about in committee that there was not going backwards. Uh, so this bill basically just clarifies that that unless the legislature uh, specifies that the, the militia, ah, this doctrine applies, it would not go forward. And that is the extent of the bill. Uh, just to clarify what the legislature intent is in these uh, situations. Thank you, Chair Johnson. Do you have any testifiers? I do not bring any testifiers with. Any member questions? Representative Considine. Thank you, Madam Chair. So if you're arrested one day, you're treated one way. If you're arrested the next day, you'll be treated a different way. Um, I, that doesn't really seem fair. In fact, the word spiteful comes to mind. Um, why would we do that? Well, right now, the way the law is as well, if you commit a murder in 1972 and you're convicted now, the laws from, I, I believe the laws of 1972 would apply. It, this is the same principle. Um, in most, most situations, you go by the way the laws were when they were in effect. Um, <clears throat> and the legislature, when, when we dealt with the drug sentencing reform, th this was an issue that was talked about a lot. Um, trying, to, trying to figure out how to, how to work it out so everybody could agree on things. And this was what the intent of the legislation was. The Supreme Court, they generally look at the intent of the law and this time they, of what the, the intent of the legislature was and this time they did not apply what our, the intent of what we planned to do was. So what this bill does, if we want to go back and apply this doctrine, we just have to make sure we spell that out in the legislation when we pass it. Follow-up, Representative Considine. Madam Chair, um, again, I'm really struggling with this because, again, that the intent was to upgrade the law and make it better. And if we actually did that, then that's what we should be applying, um, not going back to something that we thought was inferior. Um, I'm really struggling with why we'd want to do this. Um, uh, no, I guess I don't really have a question. Thank you. Thank you. Chair Johnson. Uh, Representative Considine, I, I agree. If we, with this, what this does is if the legislature agrees it should go backwards, we just say that it applies. If we decide that we agree it does not, we don't put that in the bill. That's the way, dur during that drug sentencing uh, reform act, the intent of the legislation when it was passed by both houses was that it did not go backwards. 
the court said different and did not follow the intent of the legislature. I'm just going to take a two-second break here to recognize we have 10th, 11th, and 12th grade students from Minnetonka High School here in, today with us. They're participating in the Capitol Historic Sites Voice of the People, Your Role in Minnesota Government Tour and Educational Program. So welcome to our committee. <laughs> Representative Dean, did you have a question? Thank you, Madam Chair and uh, Chair Johnson, so I think I'm really clear on what you're trying to do here because there are these cases that are sort of in the middle and you're trying to clarify that what we, um, you can say adopted or accepted because I think in the end, did we not just not act which made then the sentencing guidelines go into effect? No, we did act affirmatively? Okay. Um, <clears throat> So those cases that were sort of in the middle, and we, we have this one case that an individual appealed. Uh, I don't know if it was after the fact, after we passed it, but clearly there was an attempt there. The thing that struck me about our conversation um, during the sentencing guidelines was there's been research done on these in that individuals that moving forward have the lesser sentence recidivate at a certain rate. And actually those individuals that uh, are uh, retroactively impacted, in other words, their sentences adjusted, also recidivate at about the same rate. And I think statistically, <laughs> raw numbers, they actually recidivated at a lower rate. So I understand what you're trying to do here. I just think that, that one of the things we should be considering when it comes to our sentencing guidelines around drug offenses is I think we should consider looking at what happens if we do this retroactively because I don't think it increases the, um, the harm on the public as a result of it. <coughs> but um, I actually think it, it actually sort of helps our system and in many ways maybe even help those current individuals that are incarcerated under our old guidelines. So just, just a comment. I, I understand what you're trying to do here, but I just want to get that on the record that when we received that testimony, it was clear that there was no additional harm that was being done by making this retroactive. Chair Johnson. Uh, Representative Dean, I agree with uh, some of the things you're saying, but I'm not dealing with the drug sentencing guidelines. I'm dealing to make sure that the courts interpret our intent, not, not what, to, or to make sure that the courts do what we specified in law. Yeah, I, I agree. <laughs> Representative Pinto. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I just want to first make sure that I'm clear about how this would work, because as I look at State v. Kirby in the commentary, it seems like um, uh, offenses that occur on a certain date um, are charged and receive a conviction based on the law on, on that date. And State v. Kirby and everything didn't change that. What it changed, my understanding is, I guess maybe House Research can confirm, is the presumptive guideline sentence um, that applies um, to, those, uh, to those convictions. Maybe I could first just get that confirmed from, uh, from House Research. Mr. Johnson. Madam Chair, Representative Pinto and members, that's essentially correct. Uh, effectively, if somebody commits an offense on, say, January 1, 2014, at that time, that person is subject to all the penalties that are in law on January 1, 2014. If the law then changes on January 1, 2015, if that person's case is completely final and they've been sentenced, then there's no change unless the legislature specifically says that the new change is retroactive. If they do not say that the change is retroactive and the person's case is not done, it's still on appeal, the amelioration doctrine would apply and under that case, that person would receive the benefit of the reduced criminal penalties, whether they be penalties or sentencing guideline presumptions. Pinto. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, it, uh, so to confirm then, you know, we enact statutes that establish crimes and absolutely those statutes apply based on the date that the crime was committed and this hasn't changed any of that. Um, before the sentencing guidelines, judges could then decide what the sentence was based on the, the scheme that we'd established and now that we've got the sentencing guidelines, um, 
uh, that then control that, and so this is relating to that. Um, I guess the challenge that I'm having with this is that this doctrine has been in place at least since the 60s as it is, um, and I understand the frustration with a particular situation, but uh, in, the, in the law we talk about uh, bad, uh, bad facts make bad law. Um, if we're frustrated with this particular situation, we've got a pretty substantial change to kind of the underlying scheme of how our, our uh, state's infrastructure works, works here. This is, this, I, I suspect that in some form, this paragraph that we're looking at that would be amended goes back probably decades and even back in some form back to the English common law, um, so a couple hundred years. So um, I guess I'm really reluctant to, to add in this kind of exception without being really, really sure that we know we want that to, to work that way because these were initially established to protect the civil liberties of, of all of us. Um, and so I want to make sure we're really clear that it's not the case that we said that, um, that certain uh, cr controlled substance crimes uh, should result in a certain kind of a, a, you know, felony or gross misdemeanor or whatever it is and the courts then change that. Actually, no, that's all solid. It's just a matter of, of what is the presumptive sentence that somebody he gets, which again, as of a couple decades ago, was decided by judges anyway, and um, and so the courts have read this, read the common law, the way that things worked, and said that in some cases um, we should be looking back or looking, pardon me, forward to the to the sentence. So, um, Mr. Chair, I, I understand what you what you're trying to accomplish here, and I understand that it comes out of a negotiation that some of us were a part of it and some of us were not. Um, but when I'm looking at this right now, I, I'm really reluctant to make make changes to such to some pretty fundamental bedrock principles without kind of a, a broader sense of how this fits into our scheme. Thank you, Madam Chair, and Mr. Chair. Is there anybody from the public who would like to testify on House File 2855? Seeing no one. No further questions? Would you like to renew your motion to lay your bill over? Renew my motion to lay House File 2855 for possible review. Can we do this? The bill is laid over. Thank you. Thank you. Chair Johnson, you have another bill, House File 2856. Would you like to move your bill? I will make a motion to move House File 2856 to lay over. You may proceed. House file 2856 deals with um, increasing some of the, or allowing some out of state convictions for enhanced DWI in the first degree. Um, this bill expands the conviction to allow that. Uh, we had some situations where in uh, first degree DWI or, or felony, where the individual has had uh, DWIs in other states that for enhancement purposes could not be used to uh, enhance, enhance the DUI in Minnesota to a first degree. And that's what this bill deals with. Thank you, do you have any testifiers? I do not have any testifiers with me. Yeah. Questions? Representative Hillstrom. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair and uh, Representative Johnson. I just want to get some clarity because I've actually prosecuted a case where we had an out-of-state um, conviction that uh, wasn't similar to the process that Minnesota uses. So I want to make sure that it is your intent um, on line 2.1 that you, when you say a statute from another state or other state in conformity with the provisions listed in the clause. Um, there are some states that treat the first DUI as a civil penalty rather than a criminal penalty. Um, those states would not be in conformity with Minnesota law. Is that correct? That or? is correct. Okay, thank you. Oh, Representative Becker Finn. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so, so one question uh, I have, so the way this is written, it doesn't look like this would apply to uh, tribal court convictions. And I wonder if, uh, that was taken into account or maybe just forgotten, but that might be uh, something to look into since we, we typically, for example, in domestic violence convictions, we would, we would look at other governments uh, such as tribal courts. So uh, just, I guess, a, a comment and suggestion to consider that. I, I will consider that. Any further questions? 
Anybody from the public who would like to testify? Seeing none, Chair Johnson, you can renew your motion. I renew my motion of House File 2856 to uh, lay over. Thank you. And you have one final bill, Chair Johnson? Yes, I do have one final bill, House File 2857. I move that House File 2857 be laid over. You may proceed. Members, House File 2857 deals with blue lights on tow trucks, uh, but it limits the use of uh, the blue lights on tow trucks to tow trucks that, to towing companies that have an agreement with a local unit of government. Back prior to uh, 2012, before 169B was enacted, tow trucks were in the one, dealing, dealings with tow trucks and <coughs> laws were in one, Chapter 169. A friend of mine, who I've known for many years, even before he owned a towing company, I was in the process of building a new tow truck, and he saw the saw the the advantages and the safety that the blue lights provide on tow trucks or on emergency vehicles. And since they're working alongside the highway quite a bit and working with law enforcement, he asked me if I could find any statutes that dealt with it. <coughs> and to help him look through the statutes. Um, we f in looking at that, uh, we found a statute that dealt with blue lights and tow trucks were included at that time. So we made, we made a copy of the uh, statute, sent it down to the company that was building his new tow truck because they would not put it on, any blue lights on, unless they, it was authorized by statute. And he had his tow truck built with the blue lights following Minnesota statute. When 169B was done, it was, I believe it was inadvertently missed because when they do the statutes, they also, at the end of it, they all says go back and remove, remove the uh, towing stuff. In this type, in this particular instance, it'd be removing tow trucks and tow stuff out of the 169 statutes. And that, that I believe, is when the tow truck was removed from that statute. It wasn't an issue until about a year ago um, during, it, during his commercial vehicle inspections on his tow trucks <clears throat> that the commercial vehicle inspector <coughs> informed him that uh, he's been getting complaints and uh, wondering why the, the tow trucks have blue lights and he had looked through the statutes and he couldn't find it. Um, and so that, that's what this deals with. The reason I'm in favor of the blue lights on the tow trucks is the fact that they're safer. They cut through the snow, they cut through the fog a lot better. These tow operators, especially in greater Minnesota, help law enforcement a lot. In fact, I've used the, used the tow operators to block a highway down and shut it down so we could land a helicopter at a crash because we're that short-handed of people working the scene. Um, I also, the reason I included that they had to have a working agreement or written agreement or contract with a local unit of government is to make sure that they're working with the departments. Um, some of these, and I want to make sure that they're a reputable towing company because if they don't, if they're not a reputable, real good, reputable company, they will not have an agreement, especially in greater Minnesota where it's much more needed than some, uh, some areas of the state. I do have an amendment for this bill I would like to move that bill forward at this time. It's, it was re at the request of the Transportation Committee to make more clarification um, of, as to where the, uh, who could use and how they can use the uh, blue lights. Representative Johnson moves the A1 amendment. Thank you. Any discussion? All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries. Oh, wait, I do have one more. After the amendment was written, I was contacted not, or notified that the State Patrol had one other technical amendment which I plan to include if it, this goes in the um, 
at another time, which would be adding both the red and the blue lights only while they're stopped and engaged in emergency services, but we'll do that at that time. Um, I know the State Patrol has some issues and some concerns. They do not want to get the blue lights. Um, <clears throat> so the people are trying to remember the right word I'm thinking of at the time. So they don't get confused that the tow truck is actually law enforcement. Uh, that, that's why it's only when on when they're actually engaged in the towing service, not when they're going down the road. So that is the bill, and I'm open to any questions. Members, any questions? Oh, Representative Zerwas. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, or Madam Chair. Um, under the A1 amendment, line 1.10, um, the flashing red light and blue light must be displayed uh, only when the tow truck or towing vehicles invade, engage in emergency service. Uh, Chair Johnson, if this is if this moves forward, would the addition of and blue light uh, must be displayed? Would that require tow trucks across the state to change their light bars to be in compliance with state statute? Uh, Representative okay. Zerwaz, I'm glad you caught that. I will, we will change that to put and or. Yeah, because I, Madam Chair, and, and I don't have a great concern, but I don't want to put a burden on uh, our tow operators either. I'm, I'm, Representative Zerwaz, I'm glad you caught that. Good. Any other questions? Anybody from the public wish to testify? Seeing none. House file 2857, I move to lay over for possible inclusion. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Johnson. Members, next we have House File 390 with Representative Zerwas. Representative Zerwas, if you want to move your bill. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and uh, members. Uh, following Rule 4.20, uh, this uh, bill was returned from the General Register uh, to the last previous uh, committee. Um, I would uh, make a motion to return House File 390 to the General uh, register. Uh, Mr. Chair, members, uh, House File 390 is the uh, freeway, uh, airport, and light rail transit obstruction bill. Um, and Mr. Chair, I do have a DE1 amendment. The amendment is the language that we had in our omnibus bill, and it conforms to Senate language. I would like to make a motion uh, to adopt the DE1. Representative Hillstrom. Uh, thank you, um, Mr. Chair. If the DE amendment is different language, um, has there ever been public testimony on this language? Or um, it doesn't really comply with the rules of it's as it was passed out. So that's just the question of, was there ever public testimony on the language in the DE1 amendment? Uh, Representative Zerwas. Mr. Chair and members, you might recall if we go in the Wayback Machine, to the longest, most arduous conference committee ever known to man, in which nearly every provision uh, that the House had in the uh, omnibus bill, uh, we had public testimony on. Uh, this provision was included in that language, um, and there was an opportunity for testimony. Representative Dean. So, Mr. Chair and Representative Zerwas, so. The House language in this DE, there was debate, but the Senate language, there was no public testimony in this body on that. So, so I, I, I would say that I, I think we need to have public testimony on this. I know it would cause a problem and, and, and it would, uh, you know, create some difficulties. But clearly, we have a different bill in front of us than when we took public testimony. Uh, 
Uh, Representative Dean, uh, this is the same language we had in our omnibus bill that we did take public testimony on. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, just for everyone's clarification for any confusion, we heard House Bill 390. Um, we also heard uh, Representative Lomer's bill. We passed both of those to the General Register. Uh, when, uh, the, when the previous chair put together his omnibus bill, he used uh, language that conformed to what the Senate had passed to the floor as a part of that omnibus bill. There was testimony as a part of the omnibus bill taken at that time, and then the entire House of Representatives voted on that language. Thanks for the clarification. Thank you. Representative Hillstrom. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Once uh, the DE is adopted, I'd like a roll call on the entire bill, Mr. Chair. Roll call will be taken. Any other discussion on the amendment? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. The amendment is adopted. Representative Zeroz, please continue. Well, Mr. Chair, the bill uh, is before us in its appropriate form as it was in the uh, omnibus bill uh, previously. Um, I have no additional comments or testifiers. Okay. Any other questions from the committee? Representative Pinto. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, sir, Mr. Zervas, you were hearing me before, um, I think on other, other uh, committee meetings as well, be real interested in how any changes we make fit into the broader statutory scheme. So I can see on the prior bill about texting and driving, I can see the gap where we say this kind of behavior is equivalent to this kind of behavior. Um, uh, I'm trying to understand how this would fit into that broader statutory scheme. Um, you can assault your um, your uh, spouse or girlfriend and inflict a pretty fair amount of damage and have a misdemeanor. Um, how does this? How does increasing the penalty on this fit into that broader statutory scheme that we have as far as how penalties fit together? Representative Zero. Yeah, Mr. Chair, members, as we've previously uh, discussed, uh, these. Uh, these criminal violations have uh, significant impact and threats to health, life, and safety. Um, they put uh, officers, uh, tow truck drivers, paramedics, and the general motoring public at great risk, along with um, unbelievable impact on uh, individuals just trying to get to an airport, use a billion dollar train, or uh, access the freeway. And so, uh, we have deliberated as a body and in a bipartisan vote, the House of Representatives has passed uh, this language previously, so I think it fits in quite nice. Representative Pinto. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I guess, uh, so someone who um, restricts passenger access to a transit vehicle, you know, stands in front of a door or whatever it is, and without force or violence, because to be clear, if there is force or violence, then that is a, that is a felony. Um, but without that, um, I'm just trying to understand how that kind of behavior fits in more broadly. Maybe rather than, um, maybe I'll just say it's, it's, um, it seems to me that it really doesn't fit in well with the broader scheme. Um, and, uh, and I guess it's also notable to me that unlike other um, provisions, I do remember that debate, um, uh, we didn't hear from uh, from law enforcement um, saying this is something that we feel that we need um, uh, and, uh, and others. Um, so I have, uh, I continue to, as I expressed uh, last year as well, um, have great concerns uh, with this and, um, and yeah, I'm opposed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative becker -Pin. Uh Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, so looking at the DE1, uh, lines 1.14 through 1.17. Um, gonna get really specific here, but I think it's it's worth noting. It's a little confusing where the ors and the commas are. So if you look at the last uh, 1.16 to 1.17, um, or otherwise disrupt traffic, um, I, it sounds like the intent is that it would be a gross, it's your intent that it would be a gross misdemeanor for a person to one, interfere with or obstruct traffic that is entering, exiting, or on a freeway, or two, entering, exiting, or on a public roadway. And the way this is currently written, it's a little unclear to me whether there's also a and or three otherwise disrupt traffic. Which would be obviously, I think, a lot broader than the other um, two incidents 
that you're I think that you're trying to refer to. Uh, could you could you speak a little bit to that? I mean, I'm, I'm hoping that you're following. It's the law review where the commas are really does matter uh, type of thinking. Um, but I think it's a little confusing as written. Representative Zerwas? Yeah, Mr. Chair, uh, members, Representative Peckerfin, I think if you read the entire sentence, uh, it's a gross misdemeanor for a person to interfere with or obstruct traffic that is entering, exiting, or on a freeway, or entering or exiting, or on a public roadway within the boundaries of airport property with the intent to interfere with, obstruct, or otherwise disrupt traffic. So it also has the intent portion in there, and, it, and it's specific to uh, roadways within the boundaries of airport property. I think it's important if we're gonna splice where the comma is that we read the entire sentence. Representative becker -Pin. Uh Mr. Chair, could you just remind me um, what the motion is for, where is this going next? This will, this will be going to the general register. Uh, <laughs> Representative becker -Pin. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I would just suggest, I, um, I, I think we're actually on the same page as far as agreeing what your intent is. It's just that we need to be really clear about that so that um, if you really are intending to do this, that it's, it's doing what, what you think it's doing um, without some unintended consequences that would be, I think, even further than what you seem to want. Um, so I'd encourage you to, to really look at that because it's um, concerning. Mr. Chair. Representative Zerwives. Uh, Mr. Chair, with your permission and the assistance of uh, Representative Becker Finn, if you have a suggestion for where to place a comma, I'm all ears. Um, and of course, um, if you can be helpful with, uh, uh, with a potential necessity of a floor amendment, that's something I would be open to as well. Representative Dean. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative Zerwas. Um, <clears throat> I think I was pretty outspoken about this bill last time it came through. I don't think uh, I liked it. Yeah. Um, you know, what is your intent of this legislation? I mean, is, 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 is your intent to actually stop people from doing this, which you can do that many different ways, or is your intent to scare people from not participating in these protests? Or is your intent to come down hard with a hammer with these individuals that participate in this type of activity? I think it's important for me to understand where your head's at in this, yeah. because I, I think that, you know, to me, this looks like a hammer right now. Uh, and, and, and we know that oftentimes these protests uh, take place and these type of activities take place because people feel that they've been wronged. Uh, that there are injustices in our system, and that no one's listening or paying attention to them. And it's been proven and it's been effective in actually getting attention and getting people to listen. Uh, so I, if you could just sort of walk me through a little bit of your um, sort of uh, ongoing tenacity, trying to make sure this thing happens uh, as we're moving forward here, I'd appreciate it. Representative Zeroz. Mr. Chair, members, uh, Representative Dean, um, I prefer persistence over tenacity. Um, I think as we've talked in uh, previous hearings and I think the floor debate around, um, around this bill and, and I think other similar bills, um, I've often talked about the, uh, the volatility and the danger that is present at uh, uh, at these types of incidents, uh, to motoring public, to individuals just trying to get where they need to go, uh, to the uh, individuals engaging in the illegal activity themselves, and uh, to uh, public safety officials responding uh, to uh, the incidents on the road. Um, I have a sibling who, uh, who supervises a group of uh, metro area police officers that were on highway, uh, freeway I-94 uh, during the protest in which three pol police officers to the right of them, a University of Minnesota police officer had a cinder block dropped on his head in which he had a fractured uh, vertebrae in his neck. 
Thank God. Thank God it wasn't one of the police officers that my brother was supervising. It wasn't my brother who was standing in the wrong place when one of these unbelievably volatile and dangerous situations very predictably got even more volatile and, and dangerous. Um, my intent, Representative Dean, is to, A, discourage this highly dangerous and illegal behavior, and B, punish those that are not deterred. Representative Dean. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So, Representative Zerwas, I think you just said all of the above uh, in response to my question. But, but I want to, you know, you brought up the issue of the officer that had a, a um, concrete block or something uh, that it was actually hit by. And if I'm not mistaken, that actually was from a bridge uh, that that happened. So, it, it, your bill does nothing about this, and I believe we already have laws in place mm -hmm. that make it illegal for you to throw things off a bridge uh, onto a freeway. So, so when you use that type of sort of story and rationale, I, I'm not buying it because I don't think that applies directly now. You would make the argument, well, the officer wouldn't have been there if it weren't for the protest. But at the same, at the same time, uh, that's already illegal for someone to do what what had happened. Uh, so so I, I, I think that, um, I don't think there's as much clarity in your argument as you think there is, and that's okay, uh, because that's why we debate and discuss these things. Uh, so, I mean, I'll, I'll be voting no today. I'll probably vote no forever on bills like this, uh, but I think I really do understand what you're trying to do here, and I wish it wasn't all of the above. Uh, I wish it was trying to create more safe environments for people and uh, that we create opportunities for individuals to voice uh, their concerns for injustices that currently happen quite often. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Zerwas? Uh, Chair Johnson, members, Representative Dean. No, and I think, I think you know what I'm trying to do and what I'm trying to do is, is uh, deter as, as best we can this type of activity which leads uh, to a hazard for individuals that are compelled to respond uh, these, to these types of illegal blockades and this illegal activity. And, and you are 100% right. If, if dozens and dozens of people hadn't have poured onto the freeway, if they hadn't hurled uh, concrete blocks down at police officers, if they hadn't hur hurled construction barricades and fired incendiary devices at the police, there would have been no risk to the police. You are 100% right. But unfortunately, all of that did occur. And at the end of the day, after five hours of verbal warnings, that they were violating the law, that they were breaking the law, when they were finally arrested. The fact that they were only charged with a misdemeanor, I don't think is commensurate with the millions of dollars of cost that we've seen as a result of this lack, uh, lack of activity. The hundreds of police officers required to respond to these activities over the course of the last two years and the inherent danger subjected to our state troopers, St. Paul police officers, Minneapolis police officers, Transit Authority officers, Bloomington police officers, City of Burnsville police officers, and the University of Minnesota Police Department who answered a call of mutual aid to try to get a very volatile situation under control only to have a cinder block dropped on his head. That's what I'm trying to deter, Representative Dean. Representative becker -Pin. Uh Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I think uh, just to be clear for the record, um, obviously we don't want to see our police officers harmed, but I, I don't know that it, we ever knew exactly who did those acts and it wasn't necessarily the protesters who were there um, trying to have their voices heard. Uh, my, uh, my question for you, so as, you know, obviously we've d debated this issue for, for a while now. Um, and I, I believe that the right to protest is a, is a constitutional right. It's part of uh, being an American. 
Um, so I just want to be clear. So um, when we're talking about th this constitutional right, do you believe it's okay to place restrictions uh, on that right to protest in order to keep the public safe? Representative Zerwas. Uh, Mr. Chair, members, even with the amendment, I'd like to clarify that nothing in this bill makes something that's currently legal illegal. And so I believe that everything that is currently illegal with regards to right of way, uh, public nuisance, and the disruption and uh, dangerous impact of traffic involving uh, the light rail trains, access to airports, or um, or the freeway system uh, will continue to be illegal. And because of the inherent danger involved, I think the criminal penalty for violating the already in place uh, ordinance uh, should be implemented. Representative Becker Finn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So, w whether legal or illegal, um, you're saying that uh, it's okay to place restrictions on rights if it's in the name of public safety. Mr. Chair, members, to be clear, this is already illegal. You have no right to park your Buick across four lanes of I-94. If you believe you have that right, you're confused. You don't have that right. And so you do not have a right to lock arms in PVC pipes and, and chain yourself with a bike lock around your neck uh, to block a train. If you think you have that right, you are confused. You don't have the right to park your car perpendicular across the entrance to the MSP terminal. If you think you have that right, you're confused. And I can point to dozens of convictions uh, for the misdemeanor level of this crime uh, here in the city of St. Paul in the last 18 months of proof. You don't have that right. If if someone in your caucus would like to introduce a bill to allow people to block freeways, airports, and uh, light rail trains, then you, of course, have the opportunity to introduce that bill. But today, that is illegal. Representative Becker Finn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I will point out that the language of the bill does not say anything about Buicks. Uh, parked in any direction. Um, so, you know, what, what, what's in this bill is quite uh, broader than, the, you know, those specific scenarios. Uh, and, and just a final comment, you know, I, you spoke to the, the um, police time and effort and, um, you know, the danger that, that in theory that an officer is putting themselves in. And I, I, I do wonder, too, how much... Um, police time and money has gone into addressing other things like gun violence. And, you know, if, if we're going to look at that as part of how we make decisions, um, I, you know, I think it's relevant in, in other areas as well. So thank you. Well, Mr. Chair, members, um, I think the, the danger is actual. It's, it's not perceived. And we can point uh, to, to numerous officers that were, that were injured. Um, in, in handling these protests. Um, everything from tussles that involved uh, right. sprains uh, to uh, incidents where officers were hospitalized or at least taken to uh, the emergency room. Um, uh, I'll tell you what, when, when you're surrounded by 100 plus people and they're above you and they're in front of you and they're behind you, and they're launching bottle rockets and other work, fireworks at you. They're throwing things at you. Uh, there's not a perceived danger. There's an actual danger. Representative Hillstrom. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, Representative Zerwas, I just want to make it very clear that the um, DE1 amendment just isn't about freeways and it just isn't about protesters. And so if you look at subdivision two, um, actually line, the section uh, B, um, it also talks about restricting a passenger's access to a transit vehicle. So if I don't want my spouse to get on a transit maybe we had a disagreement and I don't want him to get on the bus to go. And I stand in front of the door with my arms saying, don't get on, don't get on, don't get on. You can't go, you can't go. I've now committed a gross misdemeanor under your bill. It has nothing to do with a protest. It has nothing to do with anything. When you added the language of restrict passenger access to the transit vehicle, you have now incorporated 
all sorts of folks that have nothing to do with protesting as well. And so um, we've had this conversation uh, on the conference committee. Um, I think your bill isn't just about protesting um, and you've made it incredibly broad and I'm not sure that folks want um, people who say, don't get on the bus, don't get on the bus, I don't want you to go, to be guilty of a gross misdemeanor as well. So um, pretty broad bill and um, I'm a no. Mr. Chair, Representative Zerwag. Uh, Representative Hillstrom, members, I would agree with you 100%. This is not a protest bill. This is a public safety bill. I, I have not uh, crafted this in any way to target uh, individuals or activities. I want to provide a safe environment for motoring public. Representative Ublum. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you Members, I, you know, we've debated this uh, last year and, and, and uh, seen all sides of the issue and everything else. But I can tell you that countless members of my constituency have said, you know, this is a public safety bill. Uh, what about the ambulance that's delivering someone to the hospital that, that can't make it? Uh, what about the, the police officers that have to go someplace that can't make it down the freeway uh, and all the numerous other uh, situations that can occur because of public safety. And Representative Dean, I think you and I grew up about the same time uh, and uh, protests in the 60s, 70s and, and all of that. I, I mean, that's part of America uh, and, and it's, it's something that's ingrained in our culture. It happens every day and everything else. But when I look at this, I, I look at it and I say, there's lots of places to go and protest. Um, and when it is endangering public safety, uh, then we have a right, and I think we have an incumbent duty upon ourselves to, to take a look at this and, and uh, look at it in view of public safety and act accordingly. Um, I, I don't think that Representative Zeros is against any kind of protests uh, and things like that. The, the public has to be heard. And we know that the public changes perceptions because of this, and that's very important. But public safety, uh, the mother that's being taken to the hospital in the ambulance, or even the, the public safety of our police officers and firefighters and things has to be taken into consideration. That's why I'm gonna vote for this. Um, and I realize that, that it has consequences for for some of these uh, some of these events that have taken place, but but we need to we need to really look out for the general public on this. So, thank you, uh, Representative Zeros, for bringing this bill forward. And it's controversial. It's controversial, <laughs> and it's going to be controversial. But I think we'll get through it. Thank you, Representative Powell. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, Representative Uglum. I disagree. It's not controversial for me. It's very personal for me. Because the day this went on, my daughter was trying to fly into the airport. She flew into Terminal 1, and she couldn't get to me because of the protesters. So I told her to take that tram, take the light rail over to Terminal 2. I'd meet her in Terminal 2. I drove over to Terminal 2. She, took, she had to get escorted through the port protesters to get to the train, to get to the light rail. When she got off the light rail in Terminal 2, she was met with protesters again. She had to get escorted through them. By the time she got to my vehicle, she was in tears. She actually broke down and cried when she got in my vehicle. You do not have the right to terrorize someone, and that's what I call it. They terrorized my daughter. So it isn't controversial for me. It's very personal for me. And you do not have the right to terrorize anyone. Protest all you want. We had protesting students just the other day, fine and dandy. None of that happened. But you don't have the right to terrorize anyone, and that's why I support this bill. Representative Pinto. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and I, I, I agree with Representative Hillstrom that this is a really broad bill, um, but the one area that it doesn't apply to is violent conduct. So I think it's really, really important to recognize that you talk about um, Molotov cocktails and, 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 and blocks being thrown and various things. Uh, that conduct is not encompassed by this bill, and so much of the rhetoric is focused on that. Um, and we need to recognize that what we're talking about is interference, and some of the comments have, have, um, have pointed that out. We can discuss how that falls in the statutory scheme, but when we keep on making the reference to the violent conduct, that's an indication to me of the hollowness of the underlying uh, arguments, that we keep on having to go to this area that is not, in fact, covered by this bill um, at all. Um, we talk about how uh, uh, the public has a right to be heard, but it is noteworthy to me that we've heard from the public so much in testimony is the concerns of this bill. Um, the recognizing that, as you say, Representative Zerwas, it's true this doesn't make any conduct that's currently um, legal illegal. What it simply does is bring down the hammer even harder on conduct um, that, is, that is unlawful. And I think we really want to be recognizing um, that uh, that when you mentioned the city of St. Paul, uh, uh, that there was the these offenses that occurred in the city of St. Paul. I don't hear folks from there. I don't hear the city attorney who charged those offenses say we really would have liked to charge a higher offense. The St. Paul City Council coming. Um, so, Mr. Zerwas, um, I uh, I oppose this bill. Um, I think that it is uh, uh, it's it's clear um, that because of the rhetoric all around it that is aimed at something different than what the bill actually described as uh, describes as broad as the bill is. Um, so, uh, so I do oppose it. Thank you. Anybody else? Representative Constantine. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mid-60s, Dr. King went to Chicago, and Richard Daley, good Democrat that he was, welcomed him with open arms, took him downtown on the weekends. They had march after march until Dr. King realized that there wasn't anybody downtown during that time period and that Daley was pulling the wool over his eyes um, doing this. And it wasn't until they broke out and went into the neighborhoods that he got their attention, which led to a break between the two of them. Um, yes, there are places you can protest, and but until you get the people's attention, it doesn't do a bit of good, is what the bottom line was in Chicago. So yeah, you can protest, but until you start ticking people off, um, it doesn't really work. The arguments and the language that you have here looks remarkably similar to what the governor of Alabama said when he started marching in Selma. Um, yes, they are blo blocking the highway, they're blocking the bridge, it's illegal, we are putting police at risk. Um, sometimes when you're protesting, you do break the law, you do put people at risk, um, but that's also how you get people's attention. Um, and. Yes, law enforcement, near and dear to my heart, worked with them for 30 years. But if you're gonna get shake things up and you're gonna get some changes, that's how you do it. You don't get it by walking in downtown Chicago when there's nobody there. And um, this bill is designed, as far as I'm concerned, to try to curb protests. You might not call it a protest bill, but that's what it's designed to do, so I really can't get behind it. Thank you. The clerk will call the roll. Johnson? Yes. Lomer? Yes. Hillstrom? No. Beckerfin? No. Considine? No. Dean? No. Branke? <coughs> Grassel? Yes. Howe? Aye. Lucero? Yes. Newberger? Aye. O'Neill? Yes. Pinto? No. Uglin? Yes. Ward? No. Zerwas? Yes. <coughs> Bill passes at uh, 9 to 6. Uh, thank you, Representative Zerwas. This bill is now on its way to the General Register. And with that, we will be adjourned till Tuesday, 10-15.